Thank you for attending this week's learning session. Uh, this week we're covering off our 12th episode, Intelligent, Intelligence Enabling Design Patterns That Unlock Immediate Value. Today we'll have Dan Demers, who is the CEO and co-founder of Cinchi. He will be joining us to take us through this very interesting topic. A couple of things to remind everybody, uh, we will be recording this session. It will be available on demand and it will be avail available for you to share out within your community because we really do believe that the more people that understand data fabrics and how data centric architecture can really enable your organization to do more, uh, the more people that understand that, the greater the community uh, growth is. So in terms of questions, uh, feel free to ask as we go along. You can interrupt Dan, or if you're more comfortable, you can just leave a message in the comments. I will be watching those and letting Dan know that there are questions there. And if you're not comfortable leaving a question out to everybody, you can also just direct it to me and marketing at Cinchi. Thanks a lot for everyone for attending and over to you, Dan. Thanks, Joanne. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you can see that okay. I can, thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, so uh, just a reminder that uh, these sessions are all recorded and available on demand at Cinchi TV. Uh, so if you missed any uh, past episodes because they build on top of each other, I uh, strongly encourage to, to check them out. Uh, last week, as an example, we covered uh, real revenue intelligence where we plugged in uh, systems like Gong uh, to do conversational intelligence and, and how we uh, added that to determine uh, customer sentiment and, and factor that into our sales process, as an example. Uh, that was an interesting topic and it's one that actually adds a lot of value to us as, a, as an organization that ultimately sells. Uh, so interesting topics on, on past episodes for sure, uh, but today we are going to cover the more broad topic of what do we mean when we say intelligence enabling and what are the different patterns uh, that one can use a data fabric uh, to unlock the, the power of, of intelligence. So uh, first of all, I think intelligence is uh, starting to be recognized as the, uh, the real asset that people are after, the real superpower. Uh, people were historically a little bit confused thinking that data itself uh, was the, the new oil as they, as they used to say, uh, but it's not. Having data doesn't really do anything if you can't turn that into applied knowledge. Uh, and then the ability to have applied knowledge is what really the very definition of intelligence actually is. Uh, so if you think of human intelligence, for example, it's not the ability to simply memorize facts, it's the ability to turn that memory uh, into decisions that you make uh, in real time as you learn. Uh, that is, that is uh, the realization of intelligence. Uh, so if you uh, look, though, at the relationship between intelligence and data, uh, there's, a, there's a hard dependency there. You can't have intelligence without the underlying data, without the underlying information. Uh, and in the traditional app-centric architecture where data is fragmented and you're connecting it via integrations uh, where you end up having uh, limited connectivity that will limit and impede, often making it impossible for you to actually deploy intelligence at scale. Uh, but uh, as you leverage technologies like a data fabric to move towards the data-centric architecture, uh, the, the more you build, the faster you go and the more connected your data is. Uh, so it, it really addresses that prerequisite of you need interconnected data to enable that intelligence. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. You can have data that's connected, but how do you apply that? And, and that's really what we're going to cover today. Uh, so there's uh, nine patterns uh, that I'm going to talk through. And uh, in some cases, I'll, I'll show you just a quick uh, a simple demo of uh, each of these patterns in, in action. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we are using the data fabric uh, to enable these capabilities, leveraging these patterns uh, for ourselves. Uh, but in your, your own respective organizations, uh, there would be very different uh, use cases that could be mapped to the very same uh, logical patterns. Uh, so uh, for any of the uh, developers out there that are familiar with the idea of design patterns for software architecture, uh, think of this as a high level equivalent, uh, but it's really for data centric architecture approaches uh, where you're essentially taking projects uh, that need a particular outcome and using this to map uh, where the fabric and how the fabric can help you uh, save time and money in the delivery of that project uh, while getting you ever closer toward 
uh, that interconnected uh, view of data where you have no integration, you have no fragmentation, and you're able to apply intelligence without any constraints, without any limits. Uh, so the, the first pattern uh, is the idea of a new business application. So that's this pattern number one. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm uh, in uh, the fabric now, uh, and I'm looking at uh, a data set that, that actually mimics this slide. So there's a slide, and you can see that there's eight, and there's one more on the next slide. Uh, and you can see that there's uh, nine rows here. So I'm going to use this because it adds a little bit more color to uh, each of the patterns. So the first one is a new business application. And let me just zoom in a little bit, make it a bit easier to see. Uh, so the first one uh, is where you would otherwise create a new internal or customer facing application. So it could be an HR system, it could be a trading platform, it could be a, a, a performance management system, it could be really anything where the end users can be a combination of uh, other employees, it could be customers, it could be both, depending on that. Uh, now, when thinking about this particular pattern, that's where you would traditionally spin up a project uh, that has a budget and you would have an IT organization uh, build against requirements that are supplied by the business and you would probably follow an, an agile and iterative approach to building it. Uh, so that's what to look for when thinking of projects that could match this pattern. Uh, and in this scenario, who actually performs the building of it on the fabric continues to be IT and the fabric acts as an accelerator to building that. Uh, who uses it, it's, it's of course the business uh, and in certain cases it can also be customers. Uh, who provides the support of the underlying platform is, of course, IT. Uh, and I'm going to show you just two quick examples of where we've used a fabric uh, to create what otherwise would have been a new business application that without a fabric, they would have been siloed bespoke solutions and we would have had the burden of doing integration. Uh, so the, the first one is how we use it as our, our, our CRM. Uh, so I'm, I'm in Senshi now, and uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, show you the full uh, fabric through the context of uh, my access uh, as Dan, uh, meaning I don't have full access to all data on the fabric. Uh, that, keep in mind that's always true no matter uh, if you're a person or a system and no matter how you're interfacing with the fabric, your access is limited based on what credentials you have and what the owners of the data have uh, granted you. That's just a universal truth. Uh, so. Uh, what you're about to see is our full fabric uh, represented from the present, because of course you can go into the past. Uh, and on the left is all the various domains. Uh, and uh, what we're showing you is uh, in our sales domain. Uh, so if I scroll down, you can also search. Uh, and if I look at sales, uh, it's all these green dots. Uh, so if we open that up, and we've shown kind of little tidbits of this in past episodes, uh, but if you look at this, it has uh, ARR targets, so recurring revenue targets, basically revenue targets, uh, commission payments, uh, examples of content, uh, SEO configuration, uh, sales incentive plans, market sizing, uh, sales opportunities, uh, customer orders, including the underlying details, uh, partners, uh, the type of partnerships that we have, our exit criteria for our sales process, uh, the stages, the actual pipelines themselves, uh, our pricing, uh, our uh, project fit questionnaire that we uh, equip uh, prospects with, and our prospects and leads and segments and territories. Like it's all the information that would typically live inside of a, of a CRM. Uh, so if I just pick one as an example, uh, so this is a data set uh, that is uh, called opportunities and I can see how it's connected. Uh, and if I go into the opportunities table, uh, well, what you're seeing is the experience. And let me go over just to look at uh, all open opportunities. Uh, you're seeing the experience that our sales team uses when they're managing their uh, actual sales opportunities. And they can look at it in a tabular experience. They can open it up in a form style experience. Uh, and uh, uh, what you can see is all the information that you would see in a traditional CRM. So if you've used any other CRM like Salesforce, it will look and feel and smell familiar to you. You got things like probability, who the salesperson is, when you estimate close, uh, estimated um, uh, revenue impacts, uh, what the next action is, uh, any notes, uh, the exit criteria, which ones have been satisfied versus not been satisfied. Uh, you're seeing uh, any of the contacts and their sentiment analysis. And uh, if you ultimately lose, what was the analysis behind that? Well, what are the linked uh, projects? What's the whole history around that? Uh, and whether I'm looking at it through this experience or through uh, the table experience, it's the same information, just different skins on top of that. 
uh, and I can apply the uh, benefit of intelligence to the CRM where I can do things like prediction. So it can tell me that on average, customers of this type of a profile will close within 2.84 months. Uh, with uh, at the stage that these, this particular opportunity is in, there's a 100% probability. And the model uh, predicts that it will, would have closed in uh, October. Uh, so this is running behind relative to the average because we're anticipating it closing at the end of December, as an example. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of the information, some of it's user managed, some of it's derived, some of it's the results of the, apl the application of models in a real time context. Uh, but this is traditionally where you would buy or build a CRM. Uh, now, for us, if we had already had a CRM, uh, then we wouldn't have rebuilt one, of course, because unless it had some fundamental flaws to it. So the whole concept when you're thinking about these patterns is it's not about just replacing everything for the sake of it. It's only uh, to be applied where you would otherwise be building something anyway. So the first question is, do you need to build anything? Uh, and if so, now it's an opportunity for acceleration through a data fabric. If the answer is you have nothing to build, uh, uh, then you at least pattern number one would not be a benefit. And uh, uh, that's the, the simple way to rationalize it. Uh, so the, the creation of a, a fulsome uh, CRM is just one uh, little example. Uh, I'll show you just one other example, one that we covered more in depth in a past episode, uh, but that's uh, Senshi TV, which is another example of an application. In this case, it's one that's internet facing, uh, and that's where we publish not only these videos, like you can see here's the uh, past episodes of the, this learning series, there's last uh, week's revenue intelligence, uh, but we also have other various live demos from conferences and, and uh, we have other you know, anytime we're in the news or any uh, how-to guides, like how to leverage the platform, like the in-depth training, uh, there's a lot of content here. But this is really an it's an Angular app, uh, which is a technology for building uh, web uh, screens, essentially web applications, uh, that is sitting on top of our fabric. Uh, so if I go back and and just show you a, a quick summary of what the the build approach is, and we just go to the next slide for a second. Uh, if we were to build that experience with a conventional app-centric approach, uh, it would have taken north of uh, just about a week, like 45 uh, plus hours. Uh, we would have had to build that GUI that you're seeing. We would have had to build the internal screens for users to be able to manage the workflows and publish videos and uh, add the tags and metadata. Uh, we would have had to worry about identity and access management, more so for the internal employees, uh, less so for the uh, customer facing because it's right now anonymous. Uh, it, we would have had to obtain and configure some type of data store. We would have had to develop a bunch of APIs to decouple the back end from the front end. Uh, we would have had to build queries and filtering logic. Uh, we would have had to create a data model to manage the physical information. So that's about a week's work uh, to create that end-to-end -end solution. So a very simple application, uh, but by leveraging our fabric that was brought down to under a day. Uh, and the bulk of that was building that external skin, that, that angular code, the front end, uh, because everything else was was either accelerated or just eliminated as requiring any manual effort. Uh, so the, the reason that you would consider applying a fabric uh, as the solution approach uh, for your new business application is that uh, it's the, the simplification of that build process. Uh, yeah, query becomes an API, you don't have to write code. There's, there's a ton of uh, accelerators with, really it's the datification of, of code. Uh, so there's still code and you code it the way that you want, uh, but you're uh, do, writing a lot less code and a lot of the mechanical work that you would typically need to code for that actually is not unique to the business problem that you're solving for is now a simple configuration and it's either data or metadata driven. Uh, so that's that first pattern, new business application. The, Second pattern, uh, and uh, please do interrupt if anyone has any any questions. Um, I'll just pause for a second. Does anyone have any questions on a uh, new business application as a pattern? Dan, just a, a question. Um, there's not one in the chat, but uh, let me ask you a question. How long do these things typically take you as a team to create? Like I know you just showed that that thing, but is it like a continuous flow, or is it that you're able to do other things at the same time? Yeah. So, uh, like in the in the old world, when uh, uh, for example, when I used to work in in big banks, and and we would uh, follow agile methodologies to have uh, you know a product backlog and and have uh, product center teams. The products are really organized around uh, applications because every app is a silo, so you would have kind of ring fence resources, and uh, so you would develop 
you get into a groove of, of really continuous flow where uh, you're able to rapidly turn around new capabilities in a much shorter time versus a conventional waterfall. Uh, so when you think of the, the impact of data centricity to that process, uh, it forces you to, to really optimize uh, the delivery model so that it's less centered around app silos and it's more around business alignment and business outcomes. Uh, so for us, as an example, uh, we don't have a separate project team that uh, has a, a backlog to manage that within these artificial silos we call applications. Uh, we have really the individual functions, whether you're in sales or in marketing or, or whatnot, uh, being able to uh, go from conceptualizing an idea to operationalizing the idea uh, along the the thought process of what is the end outcome, uh, because the they don't have to orchestrate the dependencies. So it's it's almost like Agile 2.0, where you don't have to worry about cross application dependencies, uh, because the data fabric is decoupling the apps from each other, and the plasticity is enabling you to build and create uh, capabilities that leverage capabilities from other departments and other teams and other systems, uh, but not be at the mercy of breaking changes as that as those application models evolve and change. Uh, so you end up having even more of a free flow, uh, rapid deployment capability of, of new capabilities. Uh, not to mention the fact that your dev effort is also being dramatically reduced uh, in addition to uh, the freeing up of, of that coupling. So it's, it's uh, just in my experience, it, it creates exponential acceleration. Great. Okay. Uh, so the, the next pattern is around self-service data management. Uh, so the one thing that I've seen in big organizations is uh, it's it's expensive and complex to build uh, enterprise grade uh, systems, uh, and sometimes the business has an urgent need, and uh, you've got Excel, and you can build some macros, and and you're off to the races. You solve the problem, but uh, uh, when you zoom out of that one individual or that one little team, you realize that there's a lot of operational risk associated with that. Uh, now, the reason that the business is doing that is is not because they're they're bad. Uh, it's because they need to get things done, uh, and they have the tools, and they're going to be very resourceful. So good on them uh, to to do that. But the operation operational risk and the inability to report on that data and leverage that data outside of that context uh, is severely limiting. So uh, this pattern is really where you're looking to retain the business's ability to have self-service where they can build, uh, where they're not going and submitting requirements always uh, back to IT for sometimes what are very simple requirements. Um, but there's just not enough resources to, to go around for everyone to do everything. Uh, but uh, they're leveraging the power of the fact that the data fabric simplifies that really as a replacement for desktop tools. So uh, avoiding the use of a spreadsheet, avoiding the use of, uh, of an access database and, and creating the, the equivalent functionality, in fact, better functionality directly on the data fabric. So in, in that scenario, what they're doing is instead of creating a, a spreadsheet that, you know, a, let's take Excel as an example, where you have a workbook and you have different sheets and, and you may put that on a network share or in a SharePoint and then give access to that where it's one file uh, and you can't control the access down to the level. Instead of creating a workbook, uh, you may create a, a domain inside of Senshi. Uh, and uh, a domain is really a collection of uh, various objects, which includes data sets like tables. Uh, so the tables can be pound for pound replacements for uh, the, uh, the worksheet. So uh, what you were seeing when I went to that opportunities uh, data set uh, is a tabular view. There's rows, there's columns, uh, and it's very easy to build. If I go into design mode, for example, like I, I gave it a name, I put it in a domain, I gave it a description, and I described the attributes of that. So some are text, some are links. Uh, so it's very easy to create a structure. It's very easy to maintain access to that. Uh, and the end result of that is it will look and feel and smell kind of like a, an online spreadsheet, like a Google Sheets version of Excel. Uh, where it, it no longer has the scaling limits because I could have hundreds of millions of records in that. I have the integrity where the links now resolve to other data sets and those data sets could even be from other applications. Uh, and I can link to data within my spreadsheet, but even across to other people's spreadsheets, as long as of course we have uh, the right access. So access becomes now the limiting factor to create connected spreadsheets. But again, these spreadsheets aren't on my computer. Uh, they're in the fabric, they're backed up, they're version controlled, they're access controlled. Uh, so it's very quick for a, a business. You know, it's much simpler than learning how to do a VLOOKUP in Excel, but you can create fulsome uh, solutions in a self-service capacity. So that's the second pattern of self-service uh, data management, uh, which is tends to be a, a popular use of, of a data fabric. Uh, the Third pattern is uh, the app augmentation. Uh, now we demonstrated this in a, in a past episode, so I'm not gonna show it in, 
uh, in great depth, uh, but let me just go back to the, uh, the patterns uh, data set that we were looking at previously. Uh, so uh, if you remember, for those of you who have seen the episode of app augmentation, uh, we, we illustrated how you can take a Salesforce, for example, uh, and add intelligence to that. Uh, so in that scenario, we uh, took uh, the email address, uh, resolve that to a LinkedIn profile, and then use LinkedIn to uh, basically do uh, analytics to figure out what their personality profile is, and then fed that back into Salesforce, uh, and really added that capability without needing to change Salesforce. So it's an extension, it's like augmented reality, uh, and you can't change reality, but you can augment it. You can't change the app, but you can augment it. It's the same thing, make it smarter through the power of connected data. Uh, so that's that uh, application augmentation pattern. And, and really what you're doing is you're using your fabric, uh, which is going to connect into your existing application, but it's going to be a bi-directional connect. So it's not that all data is flowing endlessly in a loop. It's certain data is fed from the existing app into the fabric and the fabric will now generate new data that may be user managed, could be AI, could be calculated derived, and that data could optionally be fed back into the application really acting as a uh, almost like a sub app within that, like a side calculator, if it's a headless app or or a, a, a parallel UI, if, if it's, uh, for example, UI enabling a data table inside of an Oracle database that doesn't have a screen for users to manage that. Uh, those are some examples of uh, app augmentation. Uh, so the, the next pattern is where you have a data warehouse or a data lake, uh, which is of course sourcing data from a growing number of existing applications. Uh, and the reason that you're doing that is to get insights from that. Well, the, the more sophisticated you get at that, those insights become more predictive and those predictions need to be acted upon. Uh, so the output of a lake is an input to a business process. So how do you app enable that new business process? Uh, well, that's where the data fabric, and so it's kind of a hybrid of the new business application, uh, but it's a very more focused usage pattern uh, where it's the general answer to the problem of, I have a new insight. Uh, for example, maybe it's predicting, maybe your bank and you're predicting mortgage churn. Uh, well, now you have a prediction that John is at risk of, uh, not, uh, of taking uh, his business elsewhere. Uh, well, you need to act on that. You need someone to manage that. You need a workflow. You need a process. You need to track that. And the result of that workflow, the result of that process itself will generate new data that should be fed back into the lake to do further analytics and analysis on. Uh, so that's the idea there. It's the app enablement arm of your data lake or data warehouse for scenarios where you already have a lake or a warehouse. Uh, the, the next pattern here, pattern number five, uh, is around reference data management. Uh, so in Reference data management, what you're really doing is you're making it easy to uh, govern and manage and uh, collaborate and share uh, reference data across the organization. And that could be within the business line, it could be across the enterprise. Uh, so I'll show you just a, a really simple example where we're using uh, the platform and the, the fabric to manage our reference data. So if I just search for uh, reference data, I can see uh, that there's a bunch of items in the marketplace. So I'm just going to collapse that. I'll just show you just some simple examples here. Uh, so we have things like sector codes, the NIAX codes. We have uh, ISO uh, currency codes. We have ISO country codes. We have uh, postal and zip codes, uh, province and states. We have uh, industry codes. Uh, and I'll just go into, let's say, country codes. Uh, I'll do provinces and, uh, sorry, postal codes. And I'll do, uh, uh, let's do industry codes. I'll do just three simple examples. So in this particular data set, it's a set of country codes uh, that uh, we're syncing from uh, the ISO data source. Uh, but uh, if you were to get this data from ISO, it would be a standalone data set that doesn't have any links and connectivity to other data sets. Uh, so what we're able to do is create that connectivity because there is a relationship between a country and a currency. In some cases, a country can have multiple currencies, but most often it has a single currency. Uh, so notice that there's a link here and we do entity resolution to resolve that and we manage that. And you can see, I actually have edit access to this data, uh, but if I look at the controls, uh, you can see, well, it's because I'm in the reference data governance function uh, and I have therefore the ability to edit and even approve data because we've turned on change approval workflows. Uh, but we've gave the entire employee workforce uh, the ability to make changes, but not to approve those changes. So I can crowdsource any corrections to any of the data, but uh, anyone who's in the governance function has the authority to approve or reject that. And until that is done, it doesn't take effect. Uh, so think of that as an opportunity for people to propose changes and comment and have conversations on, on data that may be wrong. 
Uh, and uh, we also go beyond that because we also open up our fabric to uh, some of our customers and uh, investors and uh, we, we share this data with them as well, but we don't allow them to propose changes to that. Uh, so there's country codes, uh, here's uh, uh, postal and zip codes. So you can see uh, uh, a zip code 35004 uh, is uh, related to the state of Alabama, Alabama, which in turn is inside of the country of the United States. Uh, and I can follow that data. So you're seeing kind of the graph of the connectivity of that data. Uh, and, uh, you know, if I wanted to just look at that particular uh, zip code uh, in Google Maps, I can see it's the red lines there that's showing me that. Uh, here's industry codes that's showing the NIACS codes uh, for all the industries, and you can see the, the hierarchy uh, of that, uh, so that uh, this particular code 238 uh, rolls up uh, into code 23, and 23 is a, a root code. Uh, so we can use this to segment and categorize companies into the various industry codes. Uh, and um, and that's just a really simple example. Uh, and in a in a large organization, your governance requirements will be more sophisticated. Uh, but it, fundamentally, it's the same idea where you're organizing data into domains, uh, and you're assigning ownership and stewardship to those domains, uh, and giving those owners and stewards actual control over that, uh, where they can right size those controls and leverage crowdsourcing where it makes sense. They can have data connectivity to external sources where it makes sense. Uh, but really insulate the broader org from the complexities of having to uh, discover and acquire and cleanse uh, all of that reference data that is often shared across the entire organization. Um, now, there's a, a couple other patterns here around uh, creating an application data hub, uh, which is really you're using the fabric as a shared landing zone. Uh, I'm not going to cover that one in depth. Uh, master data management, uh, where you're trying to create uh, master data sets. Uh, so I'll show you a quick example where we're doing that. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, we have a couple of entities that we basically scan for duplicates, and we use the Fabric's inbuilt uh, matching capabilities. Uh, so for example, I, I just prior to the demo, I refreshed the, uh, the sync on uh, our company's data because uh, someone may enter a company with, uh, actually, I, I didn't, I cleaned it so that I could actually run it uh, live. Uh, so I'll go into our match configuration and there's companies and let me just go ahead and execute the matching. So what it's doing is it's essentially using the MDM matching engine uh, to compare every company against every other company uh, and look for potential duplicates based on how I've configured it, which is, does it sound similar and there's different algorithms. Uh, and if I want to view the results of that matching, uh, I can now see, whereas before there was no results because I hadn't run it, I can see right now there's 271 candidates uh, and they're organized into different match sets. So it said that these two might be a duplicate. turns out that they're not. But if I were to scroll through this, I will find some genuine duplicates. Uh, and it's configurable based on you know the, uh, the tolerance for when it, it considers something to be a, a match set. I'm just looking to see if I can find one that's uh, an obvious uh, match just by looking at that. Uh, but you can see that they're all kind of sounding very similar. Like these two sound similar, so maybe they're the same. Uh, and uh, you don't have to use a sound like you can do exact matches. You can do really just different uh, models. Uh, okay, so um, looks like those are two actually different ones as well. Uh, but definitely somewhere in here, there's probably going to be a, a duplicate. So we use that to to clean whether it's contact data, people data, uh, company data, any, reference data, any of that is is a usage of that pattern. Uh, and uh, the second last use case is around the self-service data marketplace, where you're really allowing custom, uh, customers, employees to uh, have a single marketplace to discover data, to search for data, and to acquire data that has really certification of quality from whoever ultimately owns that. Uh, so that's really just the Data Fabric's inbuilt features for collaborating on data. Uh, and then the, the last pattern uh, that I want to double click on for a second is the idea of adding collaborative intelligence, which is a, uh, where you're essentially benefiting from uh, people and systems uh, where they each benefit uh, by <clears throat> gaining intelligence, but they also contribute intelligence back. So it's a, it's a push and pull, it's collaborative. That's hence the term uh, collaborative intelligence. Uh, so I'm going to give you a quick example of, of that, uh, where let me go uh, back home and I'm going to go into a people data set. Uh, and I've shown other elements of this in past uh, episodes uh, where we did, for example, the personality profiling and other such things. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up, uh, I'm just going to pick on a, an employee and I'm going to open that uh, employee up in a, in a form style uh, experience. Uh, and 
here's the employee, uh, and I'm going to look at their contact information, and you can see that their address right now is blank. Uh, but I'm going to type in an address here, but I'm going to deliberately spell it wrong. So I'm going to say 123 uh, Frant Street, uh, I'll spell street wrong, uh, and I'll do WAST instead of WEST. So I know that what I really meant was 123 Front Street West, and I haven't entered any other identifying information. Uh, but if I go ahead and save that contact, uh, then what's happened is if I go to Address Intelligence, it's that's what I entered, but it's resolved it to 123 Front Street East, uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, if I change this, let's try another example. Let's do uh, Boulder, uh, Colorado. So, you know, horrible spelling. Uh, and it doesn't even necessarily need to sound uh, like, uh, but you can see that's resolved it to Boulder, Colorado uh, in the US. Uh, well, what's actually happening is uh, you're entering information, uh, but then there's a calculated column that calls a user defined function that has maybe 15 lines of code that then in turn calls a Google Places API. Uh, uh, leveraging their AI to resolve that back to an address where you get both the code as well as the description. So that's the actual response back by typing Boulder, Colorado, it gave a couple of candidates, and then we parse out you know, what, what we think is the right one, which is the first recommendation. Uh, but that's literally 30, 15, 20 lines of code, like 20 minutes to add that. Uh, and that's a very simple example of uh, taking uh, address data. In this case, it's user managed, but that, this record could have come from Salesforce. It could have come from a bunch of different CRMs. And it's not just people data, it could be company data, it could be really anything, uh, where I can then extend that, add the intelligence, and uh, leveraging the bi-directional capabilities of the fabric, I could even feed the resulting intelligence back to those systems. So imagine I enter uh, a, a fat finger and spell it wrong in a CRM, uh, and imagine if seconds later it's updated and corrected itself using very sophisticated intelligence uh, that my organization didn't even need to build. You're basically leveraging the intelligence. In this case, it's from Google, but that could be other intelligence from any vendor, any app, any API, uh, whether it's homegrown or commercially available, whether it's free or paid. Being able to just do that in, in hours is just a very simple example of the application of intelligence to your fabric. Uh, so that that's the, uh, the session uh, today. Uh, Joanne, do you want to uh, talk through the, uh, the feedback survey? Absolutely, thanks very much. Um, so we wanted to get your feedback and we've created a survey for all of you to fill out. I've just added it in the actual chat so you can press on that. It's, it'll just take you three minutes. It'll give us some insights into what you're enjoying about it, what we could improve. And uh, just uh, if you're watching some of the other sessions. So we really appreciate your time on that one. Um, in terms of what's coming up, we have episode 13 that is uh, planned uh, for next week. We are doing our first session with a partner. So we are delighted to have Capco join us. And we have Asharan, uh, who is the managing principal of their data and digital practice, who will be also joining Dan for great discussion on data fabric myth busting. Uh, we noticed in our pre-chat that there were so many things that we needed to really have a good discussion around and make sure that we are uh, shedding light on some of the misconceptions that are around there, that we need to make sure that uh, everyone has an ability to not only hear what Dan and Sharan have to say, but to also bring your questions and ask live as well. And then finally, we realize that there are some of you that are looking for a much deeper dive uh, where you'd like us to come and teach within your organization some of the data fabric foundations, but make it very specific to you and your business needs. So with that, you can also click on uh, cinchi.com deeper dive and you can book a group session for you and your team and we'll be happy to come in and make that happen for you and again all these links are now in the chat so you can just press on them live or just copy them and uh, do them right after the session again the session will be available for all of you uh, on demand and you can watch it on cinchi tv